there was a cathedral in the time of Martin Luther where there was contained a series of relics that were used to get people out of purgatory. And if you understand that, you'll understand how Martin Luther got so upset. In every town of Europe, back when people lived and died in the same often square mile in which they were born, I don't know if you caught that, most people in medieval times lived and died, never out of sight of the Catholic Church. They worked the fields, walked the streets, and were buried behind the church. Amazing era. It was the Dark Ages when there were no books and normal people couldn't read and superstition reigned supreme. Into this world add total spiritual darkness and a complete void of truth. Add in the unbridled lust of the flesh and you have the picture of Germany in the early days of the 1500s. It's the 16th century and Martin Luther is in his late teens and his early 20s. Life in Germany was at a low ebb. Most of the peasant farm working men drank to drunkenness and lived a rough life. And the Roman Catholic Church had condemned all but a few saints to the endless labyrinth of fire called purgatory. Therefore, the souls of the sinful were to be burned in great painfulness until the price of their sins was finally paid and they were purged. So life was even more hopeless because life here was bad and life there would be bad. Then, early in the 15th or 1500s, into Wittenberg came a stream of ancient objects called relics. Relics are items that were found during the Crusades in the 12th century in the Holy Land. Relics were said to possess wonderful power. The most talked about power these relics had was to reduce a person's years in purgatory. Add to this fact that in Luther's day, the Roman Catholic Church was enduring a playboy pope, Leo X of the House of Medici. Leo had come to the papal chair by great price to his family, who bought him the position. So he was paying them back. He was selling the offices of the church to whoever would pay well for the privilege. The Archbishop of Mainz, the primate of Germany, borrowed the money to buy his office, and therefore the Pope allowed him to issue indulgences. And I'll explain all these words in just a moment. To recoup his expenses. An indulgence promised the complete and perfect remission of all sins to those or their dead relatives or friends who would subscribe to the building of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. But only half the money went for this purpose. The rest would repay the archbishop's loan by which he bought the office. Well, a popular jingle in the time of Luther phrased the promise of the Pope quite well, and you've all heard it. As soon as the coin doth in the coffer ring, the soul doth from purgatory wing. It was catchy. Let me explain the incredible relics. You may have never heard of them in the Middle Ages. Because this is what so deeply offended Martin Luther. In Martin Luther's time, if you would go through the elector of Wittenberg's castle, who's that? He was the head of that state of Germany. If you would go through his castle, you would hasten your entrance to heaven by upward of several million years. And not teasing. The elector was the political leader in Germany from the late 1400s to the early 1500s. In his castle, he had collected almost 30,000 relics. Now again, what is a relic? Well, let me read to you, first of all, from the final decrees of Trent. This is the official codified law of the Roman Catholic Church. And I'll just read the preface. The Creed of Pope Pius IV, the summary of the doctrines taught by the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, promulgated in a bull by Pius IV, A.D. 1564. You say, oh, good. 400 years ago, they don't believe that anymore. They believe it more now than they did then. And I'll explain to you. Here's what he said. I, Pius IV, believe and profess with a firm faith all and every one of the things which are contained in the symbols of faith which are used in the Holy Roman Church. First point. 
I constantly hold that there is a purgatory and that the souls detained there are helped by the suffrage of the faithful. Did you catch that? You get out of purgatory when faithful people suffer on your behalf, not when Jesus dies in your place. Likewise, that the saints reigning together with Christ, those already in heaven, are to be honored and invoked, that means called upon, that they offer prayers to God for us. Did you catch? I mean, there's so many points here, but the scriptures say that Jesus Christ is our intercessor and that the saints in heaven, uh, that they are worshiping the Lord and that their prayers are in a bowl, but it doesn't say that they call out to Christ to get people out of the fire. But that's what he said. But here's the key part. Likewise, that they and their relics, these saints by name, that's why you have little saint, you know, Christophers and saint, I don't know them, any of them, but you wear one when you're an athlete and you have one on your dashboard and all that. It's because the Pope said that the saints are to be venerated as well as their relics. And I'll explain, I'll, I'll describe the relics in a minute. I firmly assert that the images of Christ and of the Mother of God, ever virgin, and also the other saints are to be had and retained and that due honor and veneration are to be given to them, to these images, to these pictures, and to their memory. I also affirm the power of indulgences left by Christ in the church. Okay, so what's a relic? A relic is a piece of a saint's body or it's an object that has to do with a great event from the Bible. That's what a, a relic is. It's, it's a, a venerated object. It holds sacramental. Remember, sacramental means grace-giving power. And if you had gone through the castle at Wittenberg 500 years ago, that's when this event took place, this is what you would have seen. Frederick the Elector had a piece of Moses' burning bush amazing? He actually had a piece of it. He had a piece of the Ark of the Covenant. He even had a piece of Noah's Ark. He had collected a piece of everything. And the best part was if you would walk through his collection of 30,000 relics and pay the admission, you would get 1,900,000 years out of purgatory for every trip you made through his castle. Now that's the Roman Catholic Church of Martin Luther's day. You say, well, how long is a normal sentence to be served in purgatory? Well, if every trip through that shrine got you 1.9 million out, a long time, because they were selling something there. Well, in Martin Luther's time, you say, that's how it was, but the church has changed. No, it hasn't. Just about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, we, we stopped in Rome. And when we stopped in Rome, we stood in front of the great Jubilee doors. And those Jubilee doors, which are open, I might add, right now, the Pope has officially opened them. Every time you go through those doors, you get somewhere around 50 to 75 more years out of purgatory. They're still doing this in 1999. Well, now you understand why Martin Luther got so upset with the Roman Catholic Church. It's because it was told to those dear people in the Dark Ages that they would spend their money, the last money they had, to come through and see the relics, that they could get somebody, themselves or someone else, out of purgatory. And every Roman Catholic church today in the whole world has to have a relic under the high altar. And you know how you know what relic is there? Check the name of the church out. We have a, a, in Broken Arrow, St. Bernard's. That means there's a piece of him there somewhere. You go by St. Francis, there's St. Francis de Sales, a part of his body or a tear or something, a cloth from him. They have these relics, a bone or something. And so... The superstition was attached that you cannot actually have the grace of God dispensed in the Mass unless the relic is under the altar. By the way, guess what's in St. Peter's? St. Peter. That's, and guess where he is? He's directly, if you want to see it, you go down this step in this catacomb and you actually stand underneath the high altar of the largest Catholic church in the world. And there he is, his body, his bones at least, or so they say. Well, the great majority of these relics, I have to very politely say, are lacking in, in some credibility. Let me just share with you. If you took all the relic lists, and by the way, you can buy books that comparing the lists of the relics. And this is just what I came up with. If you take, uh, you know, there are thousands of Catholic churches, all of them have a relic. All of them. And if you list off what their relic is, 
and kind of use a computer to sort it and put them together. This is, just, this is just one hour of looking. There are three completely preserved right hands and index fingers of John the Baptist. Three right hands and fingers still sticking out. And they kept it because those were the fingers that pointed at Jesus Christ when he said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so they have that hand underneath the altar of three different churches. There's also the blood of Christ, which Nicodemus is said to have received in a handkerchief or a bowl. It's displayed in Rochelle, Manatua, and in Rome, as well as several other Roman Catholic cathedrals. They actually have a bowl with a handkerchief in it, just dipped in it, and that bowl of blood is left over from the crucifixion. The manger in which Christ laid at his birth is underneath the church. The cradle that Mary kept him in is underneath another church. The shirt that his mother made for him to wear when he laid in the manger is under another church in France. The pillar on which he leaned when he disputed with the scribes and Pharisees in the temple is in one church. The water pots from which he turned the water into wine are the relics of another church. The nails and pieces of the cross are shown in Rome, Ravenna, Pisa, Cluny, Angers, and elsewhere. Now, wait a minute. How many nails? was Christ crucified with? Well, it's interesting how many there are, and I'll, I'll get to the list of those in a minute. The table of the Last Supper happens to be in St. John uh, of the Lateran in Rome. The, the whole Last Supper table is there. Some of the bread from the Last Supper is in San, in San Salvador in Spain. The knife that Christ cut the Paschal lamb with is at Treb in, in other uh, part of Europe. And I wonder, how is it possible that a table from the Last Supper wasn't discovered till 800 years after the Last Supper. They found it in the 8th century, uh, about 830 A.D. That's amazing. Listen to this. If you add up the fragments of the cross, by the way, uh, Constantine's mother, St. Helena, found them, and the cross, but the pieces of it are scattered over so many churches in Italy, France, and Spain that all the pieces, if gathered, would take over 300 men to carry. And yet the cross of Christ was carried by how many people? One. Uh, you say, where they come from? Well, according to Roman tradition, the fragments were carried by angels and others dropped down from heaven onto the ground and people collected them. But those nails, I, I said I'd come back to that. There's a great controversy today about the, the three nails of the cross. Remember? I mean, that's pretty common belief. And I would agree with it. Well, listen to this. Constantine, that's the first Christian emperor, found all three of them. And he put one in his crown, and the other two he had put into the bridle of his horse, according to the Roman Catholic Church. But also, another tradition says his mother kept just one. That's according to Ambrose. But on top of that, today, if you go to a church in Rome, it has two nails. If you go to Siena, they have one nail. If you go to Milano, they have another nail. If you go to uh, Carpentras, there's another nail. In Venice, there's another nail. In Cologne, Germany, there's another nail. In, uh, in Trey, in France, there's another nail. Paris happens to have two. And there's one at Bourges. We're up to 11 nails from Christ's cross. Amazing. There's also more than one soldier's spear that pierced his side. There are several crowns of thorns. There are several purple robes. There are several seamless coats. Veronica's napkin, do you remember the one that was over his face and when, when Peter and John ran and, and Peter outran John and, 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 uh, or John outran Peter, but Peter burst past John and went into the tomb and it says he saw the grave clothes and the napkin folded separately? They found that too. Veronica's napkin was laid on his face in the tomb and there are six of those under six different Roman Catholic churches. There's a piece of broiled fish which Peter offered to the risen Savior on the seashore this is what Dr. Philip Schaff, the great church historian, wrote. Is it supposable that the apostles made relics or that they just made dinner? See, I mean, the whole thing is questionable. 